What's happening guys, Evan from TechSource, and today we are building a beast gaming and streaming PC to game over 100 FPS in 1080p across AAA titles. Now here's the thing, this entire PC is gonna cost you around $1,000 without the optional parts, which I'll talk about in a bit. I'm gonna show you guys step-by-step step from start to finish on how to build a gaming PC. I'm also gonna show you how to overclock the CPU, the RAM, and the graphics card, and I'm also gonna show you how to install Windows and download the drivers. And at the end of this video, we're gonna play a bunch of games if you wanna see the performance of this PC. You can even use this video to build yourself any PC, regardless of what parts you guys are using, because the process is pretty much identical. So if you guys want, you can follow along and build yourself whatever PC you want using this video. So before we begin, let's go over some parts. This is actually for a subscriber. He reached out and he asked me to build the best possible gaming and streaming PC for around $1,000, and these are the parts that I recommended him. All right, so the Ryzen 5 2600 fits the budget perfectly. It's a six core, 12 thread processor that offers the same performance as the 2600X after overclocked, but it's $35 cheaper. The extra two cores will help out when it comes to multitasking and encoding, so it's gonna be great for streaming. It's also gonna help out on video editing or any other applications that require multiple cores. To get a nice stable overclock, we're going with the MSI B450 Tomahawk. I've used this board in so many builds, and I keep coming back to it because of its reliability, price, and features. It has four DIMM slots, so you have the option of adding two more RAM sticks later down the road. Uh, it has USB Type-C support, and overclocking on this board is really easy. The BIOS is user-friendly, and I've had nothing but good experiences overclocking with this board in the past. Speaking of overclocking, I did pick up a cooler for only $35. Now, this is optional, but since we're spending around $1,000, I figured uh, picking up an aftermarket cooler would be a great idea since we're gonna be overclocking the 2600. This is the Hyper 212 Black Edition and it fits the theme perfectly and it costs only $35. You can even use the cooler that comes with the CPU regardless if you're overclocking or not. Uh, the cooler that comes with the Ryzen 5 is pretty beefy and I've seen people overclock their chip to 3.9, even four gigahertz or higher just by using the stock cooler on that. So that is why this is optional and it's not required for this build. For RAM, we're going with two 8 gigabyte sticks from Team Vulcan, so a total of 16 gigs at 3000 megahertz, which is going for only $90 right now. I actually got a pretty good deal on this. For storage, we are starting off with a 240 gigabyte SSD from PNY. Uh, his operating system is going to go on here, as well as a few of his favorite games. He currently does own a hard drive with all of his stuff, and he's going to bring that over to this build once it's complete. The graphics card we're going with is the EVGA RTX 2070 Black Edition, which fits perfectly with the theme of the build. And this GPU is gonna be great for gaming over 100 FPS in 1080p or 1440p. This build is perfect for anyone that owns a 144 Hertz or higher 1080p or 1440p monitor, because you're gonna be taking advantage of the high refresh rates with these average FPS counts, which you guys will see in the gaming benchmarks at the end of the video. Powering everything is the EVGA 600 watt bronze certified power supply and everything is going inside the Deepcool Ducasi V2. It's actually a really good looking case with a side panel, it's got a shroud to cover up the power supply and it has a USB 3 port in the front with a fan controller that lets you control up to three fans at the same time. For $50, this is actually a pretty solid case. Speaking of fans, I did pick up four 120 millimeter fans from Rosewell. This only cost $14, guys, believe it or not. Well worth the investment for better airflow and cooler temps inside your PC. Highly recommend this, but in the end, it is optional. It's not needed for this build. So if you guys remove the optional parts from the list, like the cooler and the fans, then the build will cost you only $1,000. But with the optional parts, you're looking at around $1,050. All the parts used in this build will be linked down below. I'm also gonna be doing a pinned comment with timestamps in case you guys wanna to skip to certain parts of the build guide. Now, with that said, there are a few things that you will need for this build. A screwdriver, obviously. I recommend the Fantex screwdriver kit because the tip is magnetic and it has an extension making it really easy to reach tight spaces. I'll leave a link below if you guys wanna check that out. You'll also need a tray or some sort of cup to hold the screws so that you don't misplace or lose them. You'll also need a blank USB drive with at least eight gigabytes of space because we're gonna be installing Windows on here. And speaking of installing Windows, guys, don't spend over $80 for a Windows copy. You can actually get it for only $15 using the link below. It's scdkeys.com, and if you guys use the code listed below, you'll get an extra 10% off. So I use these guys every time I build a PC and I save a buttload of money every single time. And finally, obviously you'll need a large flat surface to work on, preferably something that's not conductive. So if you have a wooden desk, then you are golden. But yeah, with that said, let's begin. 
Place the motherboard flat on the box and get ready to install the CPU. All processors, regardless if it's AMD or Intel, have a golden triangle in one corner. You have to match that triangle with the triangle on the actual motherboard. So go ahead and lift up the lever and while grabbing the CPU by its sides, gently lower it down on the socket. Do not touch the surface or apply any pressure, it should just fall in place. Afterwards, go ahead and lower down the lever and lock the CPU in place. Next, it's time to install the cooler. I'm gonna show you guys how to install both the stock cooler and the aftermarket cooler that I'm using for this build. Now, if you're using the stock cooler, go ahead and remove all four screws holding the brackets down, but keep the plate behind the motherboard. Position the cooler any way you like, just make sure that the cable can reach the fan header on the motherboard. The fan can only be in two positions, either the logo facing the left or the right. Gently lower the cooler down while aligning the screws with the mounting holes on the board. Proceed to tighten each screw one by one in a crisscross pattern. Do not fully tighten them at first, just enough until all four screws are caught in the thread. Afterwards, you can go ahead and tighten them in the same rotation until you can't anymore. There is no need to apply thermal paste since the cooler does come with one, but if you do mess up and need to wipe it clean, make sure you're using 99% isopropyl and some tissue paper or coffee filter to clean the surface of the CPU. Okay, now I'm gonna show you the process of installing the Hyper 212 Black Cooler. If you're installing a different cooler, just follow the instructions on the manual. It's very easy to install. First up, you'll need to figure out what socket type your CPU is, and this can always be found on the box itself. This is important because you'll need to know what screws you're gonna be using and how to install the bracket. So for my socket type, which is AM4, I'm going to install the screws closer to that longer piece just as illustrated. So insert the screw in the hole and slide it toward the longer piece just like how it is illustrated in the manual. Once you're done, we're gonna lock it in place using the wide clip. Make sure the screw is in the correct position before you slide the clip on, locking the screw in place. Go ahead and do this for the other three screws until your mounting plate looks just like mine. Remove the screws holding the brackets in place and this time remove the mounting plate from behind the motherboard and insert the one we just made. While holding the mounting bracket with your hand, carefully flip the motherboard over while making sure it doesn't fall off. You're gonna need four of these to tighten the mounting plate to the board. Make sure to use the tightening cap to tighten the screws. Next, we're gonna remove the fan from the heatsink by pulling on the bracket and releasing it. Do the same thing on the other side and remove the fan. Flip the cooler upside down and go ahead and grab the mounting bar and with the grooves facing towards the heatsink, just like I have over here, place it underneath the mounting hole and tighten the bar with a screwdriver. Do the same exact thing for the other side as well. Some aftermarket coolers don't come with thermal paste already applied, so go ahead and grab the thermal compound from the box and apply a small dot right in the center of the CPU. Remember, it's always better to overdo it rather than not putting enough, so don't be afraid if you think you added a little extra. I like to spread my paste so that it covers the surface evenly, but it's not required, you don't have to do this method. Make sure to remove the label before installing the cooler. Also make sure the logo is right side up, then gently lower it down while aligning it with the screws on the motherboard. Start by gently tightening the screws until it makes contact with the thread. Again, do not fully tighten them just yet. Stick with the crisscross pattern until all screws make contact with the thread, then you can go ahead and finish off tightening all four of the screws. Now it's time to put the fan back on, so make sure the sticker is facing towards the heatsink and using the same method as before, pull the bracket over the fins. Do the same thing on the other side. Now this cooler comes with two extra brackets in case you want to add an extra fan in the back for push and pull. That's why they gave a fan splitter cable, that way you can hook up both fans and then plug that straight into the motherboard. But if you're using only one fan like me, then just plug the cable directly into the motherboard's CPU fan header, which should be right next to the RAM slots. Now it's time to install the RAM. If you guys have four DIMM slots, there is a specific order you need to install them. It's almost always labeled right on the motherboard. As you can see, we need to occupy the second and fourth RAM slots first. So go ahead and open the locks on both sides and align the gap from the RAM to the notch on the actual RAM slot. Gently lower the RAM down and apply pressure on both sides until it snaps in place. Do the same thing for the other RAM stick and just make sure that both sides are fully locked. Before we place the board in the case, we need to install the IO shield. Make sure the text is facing the right way and apply force from inside the case until all four corners snap in place. Don't be afraid to apply force, this part can get really annoying. Next, it's time to put the motherboard inside the case. Now, if your case does not have any standoffs already installed, you have to manually put them in. 
make sure to install the standoffs in the correct place so that it aligns with the holes on your motherboard. The case I'm using already has them pre-installed so I don't have to worry about this. Gently lower the motherboard down while making sure the cutouts from the back align with the I.O. from the motherboard and I'm going to go ahead and use these type of screws to tighten the board in place. Make sure you are tightening them using your wrist, do not over tighten these. Now it's time to install the power supply in the back of the case. Just make sure the fan is facing downwards before you slide it in. Proceed to align the holes with the back of the case and start to tighten them in. You're going to need four of these screws to do that. After the power supply, we can install the SSD or hard drive. I'll show you guys how to do both, starting with the SSD. Remove the SSD tray from the case and position the SSD so that the ports are facing the top. And make sure to align the holes before screwing them in. These use the same screws as the motherboard. Before we slide the tray back in, let's connect the cables real quick. Grab a SATA cable that came with the motherboard box and connect one end of it to the SSD. We do need to supply power to the SSD, so grab the SATA power cable that's connected to the power supply, which looks something like this and go ahead and route this through the cutout in the case and plug that into the back of the SSD. Then you can proceed to slide the tray back in and tighten it using the thumb screw. Installing a hard drive is the same process, however this goes in the back of the PC. So go ahead and remove the hard drive tray and place the hard drive on it with the ports facing the top just like before and install the screws. Just like the SSD, it uses a SATA power and data cable. So go ahead and plug those in the back of the hard drive and slide the tray back into the case. The other end of the SATA cable plugs into the SATA port in the motherboard and you can find this on the far right side underneath the 24 pin. Okay, now we're going to install the fans that we bought for this build. This part is optional, so if you're not installing these, then you can skip to the next part. Start off by removing the top panel of the case by pushing in the tabs near the back. We're going to install two of the fans over here, so make sure to position the fan so that the arrow is facing up since we are using them as exhaust. Slide the fan in from the bottom and align the holes with the case and start screwing them in. Proceed to install the other fan as well and once you're done, you can put the panel back on. The third fan we're installing goes near the front of the case and since this fan is going to be used for intake, we need to position it so that the arrow is facing the left. For this, we need four of these longer screws since we are mounting it from the back. Alright, now it's time for the fun part, hooking up the cables, starting with the 24 pin. So this plugs into the 24 pin socket on the motherboard, it's not hard to miss. Make sure that it sits flush with the socket, otherwise you can have issues with booting. Next cable is to provide power to the CPU socket, hence why it's labeled CPU. This one goes on the top left of the motherboard and it's usually labeled CPU power. Once again, make sure that it sits flush. If your case has a USB 3 port in the front, then you will have a USB 3 cable like this, usually with a blue tip, but for this case, it's black. This one plugs into the USB 3 header on the motherboard, which is labeled JUSB. But be very careful with this cable because it's really easy to bend the pins if you insert it at an angle. Make sure you go straight in. Next cable is the HD audio and this one goes in the bottom left of the board labeled JAUD. By the way, there's only one way that these cables get plugged in so don't worry about plugging them incorrectly. Next cable is labeled USB and it's to power the other USB port in the front of the case. This plugs into any USB header labeled JUSB. There are motherboards out there that have more than one, so it doesn't matter which one you plug it into. We can now plug the fans into the motherboard, and the cool thing about this case is that it has a fan controller which lets you control a speed of up to three fans. And because of this, there is a splitter for three fans. So I went ahead and plugged the top two fans and the rear fan into the splitter. Now if your case doesn't have any splitters, you can plug them directly into the motherboard. Any of the headers labeled fan would work. Now since I have a total of four fans and three of them are connected to the fan controller, I still have one left to connect. So I plug the fan which is in the front of the case to the fan header on the board labeled system fan. If your motherboard does not have enough fan headers for all your fans, you can pick up fan splitters which are sold on Amazon and I'll drop a link below if you want to check it out. So the fan controller won't work unless you give it power. So grab the male Molex cable that's connected to the PC and plug that into the female Molex connector that's connected to the power supply. These are the last set of cables we're going to be connecting and these plug into the header labeled JFP1. So the first cable we're going to plug in is the power switch and this goes into the third and fourth pin on the top row. For the sake of simplifying things, make sure to have the letters facing towards you. The next set of cables are the Power LED Plus and the Minus. The Power LED Plus goes into the first pin and the Minus goes into the second pin. This is what it looks like with all three of the cables plugged in on the first row. HDD LED Plus goes into the first and second pin on the bottom with the letters facing towards you and right next to that is the reset switch. 
Once again, make sure all the letters are facing you. This is what the bottom row should look like if you plugged everything correctly. Some cases don't have all the cables, so if you're missing a few of them, don't worry about it, just plug in what you have. We are going to install the GPU on the top PCI slot for the best performance, so go ahead and remove the PCI brackets that line up with the top slot. In my case, I had to remove the second and third brackets. Grab the GPU from the bottom and insert it in the top slot until it snaps in place. Make sure to tighten it back using at least one of the thumb screws. Grab the final cable from the PSU labeled PCIe and plug that into the graphics card. And this is what your PC should look like after everything is plugged in. You are pretty much finished and you have built yourself an awesome gaming PC. The only thing left to do is install Windows, download the drivers, and overclock the CPU, RAM, and GPU. Alright, so grab your flash drive and plug it into any PC that has access to the internet. Go ahead and visit the Windows Media website and click on the Download Tool now. Open the program and just follow the instructions on there. When you get to this screen, click on Create Installation Media and then click Next. Make sure to select the flash drive option and click Next again. And on this page, select the flash drive that you connected to the PC. It's going to delete all the files on there, so make sure that you don't need anything from it. The files are going to be downloaded into the USB drive, and this process can take some time depending on your internet speed. So just sit back and wait for it to complete. Once it's complete, just hit finish and remove the USB and plug it into the PC that we just built. Before you power on your PC, make sure the cable is plugged in behind your power supply and the switch is set to the line. Also make sure that your HDMI or DisplayPort cable is plugged in directly into your graphics card. Hit the power button and wait for the PC to boot up and it will automatically detect the USB drive and take you to the Windows setup page. If it doesn't detect the USB drive, make sure to plug it in from the back side and if that still doesn't work, you have to manually boot from the USB by either hitting F8 or whatever key is assigned to it depending on your motherboard. Once you're at the main screen, follow the prompts until you get to the activate Windows section. Over here, type in the Windows CD key and hit next. Remember, you can get a Windows 10 key for less than $15 through the link below. And if you guys use the code TSS2, you can get an extra 10% off. In the next page, you have to select which version of Windows you're installing. And it's really important that this matches the same version of Windows on your CD key. In my case, I bought Windows 10 Pro, so that is the version I'm selecting. Go ahead and accept the terms on this page and make sure to select the custom option and pick which drive you want Windows to be installed on. I strongly recommend picking your SSD over a hard drive for faster speeds. In my case, I only have an SSD installed, so I'm going with that option. Windows will then begin installing the files to your drive and it will restart a few times. So just make sure to follow the prompts on there until you get to the desktop screen. Now I'm gonna show you guys how to download and install the drivers. I will leave a link to all of this down below, so all you have to do is click and download them. You still need internet access, so find the PC that has it and visit your motherboard website and go to the support tab and select the version of Windows you are using. These are the drivers that you need to download. The chipset driver, the onboard audio drivers, and the LAN drivers. If your motherboard has built-in Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, then make sure to download those drivers as well. So if you're using an NVIDIA GPU, go to the GeForce website and download GeForce Experience. If you're using an AMD GPU, go to the AMD website, scroll down and download the Auto Detect tool. If you want to overclock your CPU, download the Cinebench R15 Benchmark and HW Monitor so that we can monitor the temps. Now if you guys want to overclock your graphics card, download MSI Afterburner. And to benchmark the GPU, we're going to be using Heaven Benchmark. Once again, I'll drop a link to all of this down below so it's easier for you. Once everything is downloaded, open them up and install the files to your PC. Alright, so now your PC is officially ready to go. If you're not planning on overclocking, then you're done. If this was helpful to you guys, dropping a like would be awesome. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next one.
For those of you who want to squeeze extra performance out of your PC, we're gonna overclock it, starting with the CPU. So go ahead and restart the PC and hit the delete key on the keyboard so it takes you to the BIOS screen. Once you are here, hit F7 to enter the advanced mode and then go into the overclocking menu. Change the explore mode to expert and just copy my settings if you're using the same CPU as mine. Set the CPU to 4 GHz, then change the XMP profile to profile 1 and set the DRAM frequency to match the frequency of your RAM. I'm running 3000 MHz rated RAM so I set it to 3000. Go ahead and scroll down and change the CPU core voltage to 1.3 volts and the DRAM voltage to 1.35 volts. This is a very safe overclock even with the stock cooler but to make sure the PC is stable we're gonna hit F10 to save the changes and then reboot the PC. Once you're on the desktop, open up Cinebench R15 and run the CPU benchmark. If it completes without crashing, then that's a good sign. As you can see, the CPU temps are under 60 degrees, which is really good. If your CPU temps go above 85 degrees, that's when you should start worrying about it. If you guys feel comfortable, you can always go back into the BIOS and increase the CPU frequency. I was actually able to push my 2600 to 4.1 GHz at 1.325 volts. Just remember, if the PC crashes when you increase the frequency, you need to go back and increase the voltage. I like to increase the voltage in small increments of 0.0125, but whatever you guys do, do not pass 1.4 volts on your Ryzen 2 chip and make sure the temps aren't going over 85 degrees. The best way to test how stable the overclock is, is by actually gaming on it. So if your PC crashes within an hour of gaming, then you need to go back into the BIOS and lower the settings. If you're happy with the CPU overclock, we can go ahead and proceed to the GPU overclock, which is a lot easier. So go ahead and open up MSI Afterburner and the Heaven Benchmark. Set the quality to Ultra and Tessellation to Extreme and make sure the resolution is 1080p but windowed so that it doesn't go full screen. If you want, you can click the Detach button on the MSI Afterburner and move the monitor chart to the right side to check out the temps. Go ahead and drag the power limit bar all the way to the right and hit the check mark to save the settings. We're gonna open up the Heaven Benchmark and hit F9 so that the benchmark starts. Now while it's running in the background, we're gonna increase the core clock. I like to start at 50 megahertz, so we're gonna change it to 50 and hit apply, and we're gonna wait for the benchmark to complete one cycle. If it doesn't crash, we can go back and increase it by another 25 megahertz, and you can do this until it gets to a point where it crashes. I got my GPU up to 125 megahertz, but as you can see, the benchmark crashed as soon as I hit apply. So I know for a fact it's gonna be stable at 100 megahertz, which is what I left it at. I could go back and increase it by 5 megahertz and probably squeeze more performance out of it, but I left it at 100 just to keep things simple. Now it's time to overclock the memory. It's the exact same concept, but this time you can do 100 megahertz increments since memory overclocks a lot easier. So make sure to leave the benchmark running for a full cycle before increasing it. If you're happy with the GPU overclock, make sure to save your profile and hit the Windows button so that way it overclocks it when you boot your PC. Remember, if your PC crashes during gameplay, you have to go back and lower the clock settings until your system becomes stable. These benchmarking tools don't really compare to real world use, it's just meant to be used as a starting point. As you can see, this is a pretty beast gaming PC. You can pretty much max out any game and still get well over 100 FPS in either 1080p or 1440p resolution. I also think the build turned out very nice with the old black stealth look. Overall, very cool temps thanks to the extra three fans we installed and the case design. But what's more impressive is how quiet the system is while gaming. And that does it for my build guide, ladies and gentlemen. If this was at all helpful or if you guys enjoyed the video, leaving a simple like would mean the world to me. It took me a good week to put this video together for you guys. It does take a long time, so I greatly appreciate any likes or dislikes you guys can leave for this video. I'm really happy with the way it turned out. It's a really clean build, and I know that Sergio would be happy to game and stream on this beast. It is officially TechSource certified after all. <laughs> but anyways, guys, I'll drop a link to all the parts used in the build down below and consider subscribing if you guys enjoy content like this. Thanks again so much for watching and I will see you in the next one.